concluded that the interpretation of scripture must always be compared with, inserted into, and authenticated by the living tradition of the church. Only the ecclesial context enables the understanding of sacred scripture as the authentic word of God that becomes the guide, norm, and rule for the life of the church and the spiritual growth of the faithful. This entails the rejection of all subjective interpretations, as well as those simply limited to one's analysis, which is incapable of incorporating the global sense that has guided the tradition of all God's people throughout the centuries. Bible Believers Fellowship is King James only. That simply means we use the King James Bible, whether we're preaching, teaching, writing, producing videos. We use the King James Bible because we believe that the King James Bible is the Bible in English. And that means that we believe that God has preserved His Word that was originally given in Hebrew and in Greek, and that he preserved his word in English. It is represented by the King James Bible. People ask us, why, what do we mean by King James only? And what we're not saying is that we think you're going to hell if you're using a new translation. We get those emails all the time. We've never said that we believe anyone's going to hell. We believe you're in danger spiritually because God's word is your lifeline. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're going to grow and you're not going to go into heresies and false doctrine and into the false church that's being built right now in preparation for Antichrist, then you need to use God's book, which is the King James Bible. And we're not saying that uh, you can somehow lose your salvation if you're using a new translation. We believe you're saved by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus died for your sins, was buried and rose again. If you believe in that, then you're saved. And the question isn't about whether or not you're saved or going to lose your salvation. The question is, are you going to use God's book or man's book? Or, as we're going to look at later, there's evidence that Satan's fingerprints are on these new translations. And we're not trying to accuse anybody of anything. We simply believe the King James Bible. We are saying this, the new Bibles are not the same as the King James Version. And we're going to demonstrate that in just a minute. We are saying that the new Bibles are corruptions and not just changes. They're not improvements. They're corruptions of the Word of God. And we do believe that true Christians, once they see the evidence we're going to talk about, that once you see this, if you're a true Christian, you shouldn't be able to stomach what we're about to see. The new translations add to the Word of God, take away from the Word of God, and then introduce corruption in the way they translate words. According to a man named Jack Mormon, that's M-O-O-R-M-A-N, there are a total of 140,521 Greek words in the traditional Greek New Testament. I believe he's talking about this uh, Stephen's 1550 uh, Textus Receptus. And according to uh, Jack Mormon, out of these uh, 140,521 words, 
2,886 words are missing in the uh, new text and the new Bibles that come from that text. Now people always ask if I uh, can understand Greek and if I can read Greek and I can and I'll demonstrate to you for a purpose. Here is John 1, 1 in the uh, received text, Stephen's 1550 edition. In arche, in hologos, kai hologos, in proston theon, kai theos in hologos. And that is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, as I was reading that, most people watching this couldn't understand a word of it. That's why we need English Bibles. And the idea that God would force Christians to have to learn Hebrew and Greek in order, in order to understand His Word is ludicrous. God has produced His Word in English, and it comes from the correct text in the King James Version. Now we want to uh, look at a checklist. These are verses that you can look at in your Bible if it's not a King James Version, and you can see the changes that have taken place in the new translations. First, uh, it's incredible to understand and realize that the new translation introduced an error in the very first verse of the Bible. In the King James Version, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The King James uses the singular heaven because that's all that was created in Genesis 1.1. There are three heavens. We refer to them as uh, three heavens. The third heaven is where God is. That was not created. That already existed before Genesis 1.1. The second heaven is outer space, the universe outside of the earth. And that is what is uh, spoken of here in Genesis 1.1. The first heaven is our atmosphere. And that isn't created in Genesis 1.1, that's created in Genesis 1, 6 through 8. So the King James correctly says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And yet in the New Translations, they introduce an error in the very first verse. If you read the New International Version, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you read the New American Standard Version, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. The same thing in the New Living Translation, the same thing in the Message. And as far as I've seen, every new translation changes that from heaven to the plural heavens, and that's an error. And that makes the Bible uh, start off in the very first verse with a lie. So right from the very first verse, you can see there's a problem uh, in these new translations, but the King James Version is accurate. The second place we want to look at is Isaiah 14.12. In Isaiah 14.12, the King James Version says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? This verse is where we learn the name of Satan before he fell. And his name here is Lucifer. But if you read the New International Version, they remove the name Lucifer and they stick in the words or the, the title, O Morning Star. It reads, How have you fallen from heaven, O Morning Star, Son of the Dawn? Uh, the same thing in the New American Standard. How you have fallen from heaven, O star of the morning. Uh, the New Living Translation, How you are fallen from heaven, O shining star. Well, if you look in your Bible at uh, Revelation 22.16, Jesus is the morning star. So in your New Translation, it's not Lucifer that's been fallen and cast from heaven, it's Jesus Christ. And the translations enter, insert the word day star. But if you look in 2 Peter 1.19, that's not Satan, that's Jesus Christ. He is the day star. So that is a satanic corruption. That's just not a change and an error. That is a satanic corruption. They've removed the name of Satan before the fall, Lucifer, and inserted a title 
that belongs to Jesus Christ. That is enough reason right there to not use new translations and to use the King James Bible. But let's go on. Daniel chapter 3 verse 25. Nebuchadnezzar threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the uh, fiery furnace. And instead of seeing them go up in smoke, he looks in, he says, in Daniel 3.25, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. That's an obvious reverence to Jesus Christ. There have been thousands of messages preached by preachers on how Jesus was the fourth man in the fire, but yet in the NIV it changes that, and Nebuchadnezzar says, the fourth looks like a son of the gods, plural. The same thing in the New American Standard, a son of the gods. And in other translations, they change it in the footnote so that it just simply casts doubt on whether or not that was Jesus Christ in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now again, that's just satanic. And how a Christian can see these changes and not be disturbed is beyond my comprehension. In Matthew 5.22, here the uh, King James Version quotes Jesus Christ. And he says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, the new translations change that. And if they're right, then Jesus Christ is a sinner. Because the NIV says, But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. The same thing in the New American Standard. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Now, the problem with that is that Jesus was angry with his brother. If the King James reading is true, then he was angry with a cause. So there's no problem. But in the New Translations, it just simply says if you're angry, then you're in uh, danger of the judgment. And if you turn over to Mark chapter 3, verse, verse 5, it says that Jesus looked upon them in anger. And you can't tell me that when Jesus cleared the temple and turned over the money changer tables and drove them out and yelled, screamed at them with the bullwhip, <laughs> you can't tell me that He wasn't angry. He was, but it was with a cause. And according to the King James Version, that means that it was justified. The New Translations turn Jesus Christ into a sinner. John 1.18 is another place you should look in your New Translation. It says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. Now what's wrong with the New Translations? Well, the NIV changes that to say, No one has ever seen God but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side. What's wrong with that? It just simply makes it nonsense. You can't refer to God and then Jesus as God the one and only, and then refer to Him as sitting at the Father's side. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they're not three separate gods. And so to call Jesus God is fine, but when you say that uh, no one has ever seen God but God the one and only, you've just made the Bible into a bunch of nonsense. But what's worse is in the New American Standard, which says that no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained Him, which is a terrible translation. Uh, but Jesus is not a begotten God. He's the only begotten Son. He is the eternal God. He was begotten of Mary, but He was eternally, and is eternally, past, present, future, God. And uh, this translation from the New American Standard matches the cult translations, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses in their New World Translation. They say, the only begotten God. And the last one we'll look at is in 1 Timothy 3.16. Now this one, uh, I'll tell a story about it, but it says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. 
God was manifest in the flesh, an obvious reference to Jesus Christ being God. Now I was witnessing two Jehovah's Witnesses and I had them returning to my house and after about six or seven weeks I got them on the subject of the deity of Jesus Christ. And this uh, particular conversation we were talking about Jesus Christ being God and I picked up my Bible and the one I had was an NIV and I opened it up to show them that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh and when I got there it was gone. If you look in your NIV, it says simply, He appeared in a body. Well, so did I. Big deal. The, the verse is special, not because He peer, appeared in a body. Jesus is special, not because He appeared in a body, but because He's God appearing in a body. And the new translations have corrupted that. The same things in the New American Standard Bible. By my confession, great is the mystery of godliness, he who was revealed in the flesh. The uh, New Living Translation says Christ was revealed in a human body. You can't, that, the Greek word for Christ is Christos, and that's not in any Greek manuscript on the face of the earth. Why they put the word Christ in there is beyond me. And then in the, the message it says the same thing, he, he appeared in a human body. Now that's just a handful of the changes that have taken place in the new translations. You can look at Isaiah 7.14 in the Revised Standard Version. They changed virgin to maiden, destroying the uh, prophecy of the virgin birth. If you look in the NIV throughout the Old Testament, references to sodomites is changed to, quote, male shrine prostitutes. And that's been capitalized upon by the homosexual and gay rights movement today to make it look like uh, the only time homosexuality is a sin is when it's done for prostitution purposes. 2 Corinthians uh, 2.17 in the King James says, Not as many which corrupt the Word of God. And they've changed that to say, Not as many as peddle the Word of God. Why? Because they are corrupting the Word of God, so they had to change that so it didn't nail them in their sin. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all evil. And the new translation changed that to say the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Just like Satan in the garden, taking a word out, changing a word here, adding a word there, and they totally corrupt the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15 is the only commandment in the Bible to study. And the new translations take the word study completely out, and it says be diligent to present yourselves. Now what's that mean? Take a shower, get a haircut, brush your teeth. I mean, what's that mean? It, the King James tells you to study. The New Translations change that. And another place is 1 John 5, 7. Totally removed. Uh, the last 12 verses of Mark are either removed or put in brackets and so on and so forth. And we'll talk more about that in a, in a future segment. But this gives you the basics as to why we are King James only. We use the King James version of the Bible. We don't use any other. We don't recommend any other. And we do expose the corruptions in the new translations because we believe you should not add to or take away from the Word of God. And we'll look at that in a moment, but that's a commandment from God. We should not toy with God's Word, taking words out, adding words, and corrupting words. And it actually has very strong condemnation in God's Word for those who do such things. When Bible believers see the corruptions in the New Translations and they compare their King James Bible to the New Bibles and they see the differences, the next question they ask is, why? And there are several good answers to that question, but the major reason why there are differences between your King James and these New Translations whether it's the NIV, the New American Standard, the New King James, the New Century, the New Living Bible, whatever new translation you're reading, there's a difference between that and your King James Bible, and there's a reason why. The fact is, there are two Bibles. There's a pure Bible and a corrupt Bible. During the lifetime of the apostles, there were attempts to corrupt the Word of God. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. You see, even while Paul was still alive and writing the Bible, 
men were trying to corrupt that Bible. And they did succeed in producing corrupt manuscripts. But God also kept a pure line of manuscripts that became known later as the Byzantine or traditional text. We now call the New Testament from this line the Received Text or the Textus Receptus. Now if you look at this chart that we hope to have available as a download as a PDF on our website, the writing of these books began uh, around 65 AD when the events of the book of Acts uh, ended. And 2 Corinthians 2.17, if you look up here, it was written sometime between 65 and 105 AD. The book of Revelation was written close to the death of John uh, around 105, 195 AD. So between 65 and we'll say 105 AD, uh, men were corrupting or trying to corrupt the Word of God. And if you look at the chart, you'll see two streams of Bibles. You'll see the pure Antiochian stream, and you'll see this other down at the bottom in red, which is the corrupt Alexandrian stream. These corruptions that took place between 65 and 105 AD produced a set of manuscripts. The two major manuscripts are Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. What we believe is that God uh, inspired the original writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, Paul, James, and Jude, and Peter. And that after those were written, the last apostle who wrote the last book, the book of Revelation, around 105 AD, he died. And that was the end of the apostolic office. And that's why we believe no books after that uh, are to be included in Scripture. From those texts, the Masoretic Hebrew and the Textus Receptus Greek text came true Bibles, pure Bibles. It began with the Old Latin and the Old Syriac. Those aren't to be confused with the Latin Vulgate written by Jerome and uh, the later uh, Palestinian Syriac. Jerome's Latin Vulgate and the Palestinian Syriac actually have the correct base and uh, that's documented in one of the books we recommend called Forever Settled by Jack Mormon, M-O-O-R-M-A-N, a pastor in London, England. And uh, those had the right base, but then they were corrupted uh, through Sinaiticus and Vaticanus readings in order to uh, be closer to the Roman Catholic doctrines and things that they wanted to promote. And what you'll find as you go through this stream is that it's the pure Antioch stream used by Bible-believing Christians versus Rome and the Pope. The bottom line is that you can see a two-fold stream one with pure Bibles and one with corrupt or false Bibles. And when you look at that line, you see it just so happens that the people who are using the line of Bibles that our King James comes from happen to be people who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, who preach the true gospel. On the flip side, in the area of the corrupt Bibles has always been a false gospel. And that would explain why since 1881, and especially since about 1968 and the adoption of these new Bibles by Christian denominations, 
that we are seeing apostasy. We are seeing Christianity go down the toilet in America. We are seeing denominations totally uh, turn away from the preaching of the gospel and to embrace things such as the homosexual uh, rights movement and gay marriage and uh, putting homosexuals in the pulpit, they go hand in hand. This kind of thing goes hand in hand. Now let's look at these two streams. Again, in the pure Antioch stream, you, you start with the old Syriac, old Latin. Around 400 AD, the Gothic Bible was translated um, by Ulfius, I believe was his name. And then you have the Armenian, the Ethiopic, and the Georgian Bibles uh, coming in that order. And then the Slavonic Bible, I think, was around the 9th century. They actually created a language in order to translate a Bible for the people to read. And that's a fascinating story as well. And if you notice, I've got up here an unknown number of foreign Bibles through the centuries. One of the most disgusting things being taught in Christian schools today is, number one, that uh, these are only a handful of Bibles that exist uh, that were given to us from the traditional text and they downplay the number of translations that came from the true stream. The fact is that during that period of time where you have the Old Syriac, the Old Latin, the Gothic, Armenian, Ethiopic, Georgian, and Slavonic, there were horrible persecutions. At first it came from pagan Rome, and then it came from the Holy Roman Empire and the popes. The persecution included burning their churches, burning their books, and burning the people. The people would be tortured until they would confess uh, or give up uh, the location of their Bibles and their literature. And today's Christian educated idiots in our seminaries and colleges, they pretend that the writings that we now possess somehow represent what really was written back in that time. The fact of the matter is we don't know how many foreign languages had Bibles, and then the scholar sits around and pretends that by counting the number of quotations from this area and that area and the church fathers and that sort of thing, that they can somehow grade the Bible and decide which uh, Bible verses to keep in it and which to cast out. What they are doing is rewarding Satan. Satan attacked Christians, killed them, burned their churches, burned their Bibles, and that's the only reason we don't have those texts and the scholars know this but they lack all common sense and they continue to teach that we should go by the extant manuscripts alone pretending that all these other things didn't happen and that they don't the other writings don't exist we take into consideration the reality. Satan has used the Pope, the Roman Church, and other governments under the control of Rome to burn Bibles and kill Christians throughout the ages. And now that gives us the background we need to understand where the King James Bible came from and where these new translations come from. The King James Bible has this history behind it. And then from that pure stream, Erasmus gave us a Greek New Testament. People will falsely claim that Erasmus just didn't know about Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. The fact is we have writings, letters written to him that prove that he knew about them and he rejected the readings. He only used a handful of manuscripts because he recognized those, in his opinion, as being pure manuscripts. And based on those handful of manuscripts that he felt were the purest, 
then he came up with the, his version of the Greek New Testament and from that Greek New Testament and the Masoretic Hebrew text Luther gave the German world a Bible and I believe that was around 1560 and uh, that set Germany on fire with the gospel and then the Roman Catholic Church had not allowed for a Bible in anything other than Latin throughout the Dark Ages. That's why the Dark Ages were the Dark Ages. You, you study it, you'll find out that Origen and Augustine and Jerome and the popes were the, uh, basically the reason there was a Dark Ages. And during the Dark Ages, there was nothing but Jerome's Latin Vulgate in the Roman or Western churches. And you can see that during the Dark Ages, Latin as a language really dies out. And the Pope forbid any other language translation. He wouldn't allow the Bible to be translated. But the Pope kills millions for owning Bibles in their own language. You can read about this in Fox's Book of Martyrs or uh, other church histories that are um, accurate. The Pilgrim Church by uh, a man named Broadbent is another resource. Uh, Peter Ruckman's uh, History of the New Testament Church. There are several resources where you can read about this. Where Christians were caught by the Pope owning a Bible in their own language, they would be burned at the stake and they would tie the Bible around their neck and burn the Bible with the person. And that's the kind of thing the Pope did to stomp out the efforts to get the Word of God in the language of the person reading it. As a result of the Pope's persecution of those who want the Word of God, no other language text uh, Bible show up during this Dark Age period until Erasmus and until Luther and until the uh, new Bibles that came out uh, in English prior to the King James 1611. And at that time then, the Pope did put out English and other translations, but only to counter the pure text Bibles. That's why uh, if you read those Bibles, they are different because they come from the corrupt text and they make corrupt changes. And these new Catholic Bibles are corrupt Alexandrian versions. And we see up here that the new uh, Catholic Bible during the time of the Ref Reformation and right up before the translation of the King James was the Douay version which came out 1582 New Testament and 1610 the Old Testament and the New Testament were combined into one Bible and a year later we see the King James 1611 comes out so again taking a look at this stream of Bibles you can see the King James version comes from a pure stream but then later in 1881, the revised version came out and they used what's called the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. That New Testament was a switch from the Erasmus Greek New Testament, but Westcott and Hort in 1881 came out with what's called the revised version English Bible in England, and it was based on this Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament. And that is based on the corrupt Alexandrian manuscripts. After the publication of Erasmus Greek text came a line of pure, uh, purified English Bibles. Psalm 12:6 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And that is why when you look at the history of English Bible translations, you see a line of seven. Each one of these made improvements upon the other and it was a purifying effect from the Masoretic Hebrew and Textus Receptus Greek text came a purification till finally we get our authorized version of 1611. And that is why you'll see on our chart that we have 1769 as the final revision of the KJV. The 1611 was the last English translation to come from the pure text before the apostasy, apostasy set in. These revisions that took place up to 16, uh, 1769 
were revisions of spelling and grammar and uh, that sort of thing. It did not change the translation. On the other hand, these Bibles come from the Alexandrian text that the Pope gave you. And that includes the, uh, you could put the revised version of 1881 at the top. But in America, the English Bibles coming out of that text are the American Standard of 1901, the Revised Standard Version of 1954, which, among other things, removed the word virgin from Isaiah 7.14, uh, destroying the prophecy of the virgin birth, the Amplified Bible of 1965, the Living Bible of 1971 that originally had uh, son of a bee, <clears throat> I'll not say the word, and other uh, horrible translations in it, the New American Standard Bible of 1971, which among other things, uh, uh, including the things I've already mentioned, uh, in John 1.18 turns Jesus into a cr uh, created God uh, and that matches the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Then in 1982 is the New King James Version, which lies in its preface and says it comes from the Textus Receptus, but you can find numerous places where they have used the corrupt New Bible text. Uh, New Century Version of 1991, New Living Translation 1996, Message, a total of more than 300 new Bibles in 100 years. They change important doctrines and they contradict the Bible that Christians have used for 2,000 years. And if you study it, you'll find that the new Bibles come from a corrupt line and the King James comes from a pure line. You can read uh, all of this for yourself if you get a hold of David Otis Fuller's books. One is called Which Bible? Another is called True or False, and a third one is called Counterfeit or Genuine uh, regarding Mark 16 and John chapter 8. We also highly recommend a couple other books. One, Manuscript Evidence by Peter S. Ruckman, and one that I just finished reading, Forever Settled by Jack Mormon. We believe that God has kept His Word pure, and we believe verse 7, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Preserve what? His pure words. Authorized King James Version. Once the Bible believer sees the differences between the new versions and the Bible that has always been used by Christians, when you compare that King James Bible to the new versions and you see these corruptions then you have to wonder why and so we looked at the history to show that uh, Christians have always used the Antioch Bible and there's a second Bible there are two Bibles and that other Bible is called Alexandrian and that's why the new versions are so different from the King James is because it's a totally different Bible and so then the next question is uh, why is this Bible so different well the answer is this Bible is different because it belongs to the Pope. The new versions come from a Greek text that is basically the Vaticanus manuscript with edits based on Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, and other materials. But by and large, your new version, whether it's an NIV, a New American Standard, or whatever it is, is based largely upon the Vaticanus, the Westcott and Hort text, as it's called, when it came out in 1881 was basically the Vaticanus manuscript and uh, Westcott and Hort lied to the body of Christ they said they would revise the King James Version using the received Antioch text and they didn't they came out with the Vatican manuscript uh, that they claimed was their own and uh, produced a whole new translation the revised version is not a revised version it's a new Bible um, that was rejected 